All right. Uh, thank you, Susan. And thank you, everyone, for showing up for this session and showing some community love. Uh, yes, so mapping the landscape of digital uh, preservation networks. It's a short paper not only written by myself, but my co-authors are listed up here. And I have the honor to share our results today. So let's start out with uh, thinking of who or what is Nestor, in case you've never heard of Nestor before. So Nestor is uh, possibly this guy in the middle there, a Greek argonaut, but it's also a very German-sounding acronym, Nestor, uh, the network of expertise for long-term storage and availability of digital resources in Germany. So it's the German meeting ground around digital preservation, essentially, like a very little sibling of the DPC in German, maybe. It was founded in uh, 2009, so again, to draw the parallel to the DPC, it's not quite as old. We're currently going through our teenage years, which comes with a lot of teen angst, leading to us changing our legal form in 2022. That's uh, how things go, but still going strong with over 20 institutions that are active in, net, in the network. And currently in the recently uh, new found legal form, 13 of them signed as members. There's a few products that Nestor has, or a few services. We're known for the Nestor SEAL, which is a certification of trustworthy digital archives uh, based on Dean 31644. So in addition to Core Trust SEAL and the ISO uh, certification, it's the big certification framework there is. And I'm often asked uh, around the international digital preservation work whether the Nestor SEAL still exists. Yes, it does. Please check it out, it has been translated to to different languages as well, and uh, we ourselves are currently going through recertification against Nestor Seal. In addition, Nestor has regular events such as the Nestor Praktika Tag, which is a practitioner meeting that takes place once a year, Nestor Virtuell, which is a virtual set of discussions that we set up uh, during the pandemic, and recently Nestor started a podcast as well. There's 15 different working groups, for example, on things such as media, zip structure, and on communities, which brings us to this paper. The Nestor Working Group uh, around communities was formed with the goal to uh, formulate the survey, conduct it, and then evaluate it afterwards. So why even do a community survey? You may have heard already other great talks and presentations here around surveys. There's many surveys that exist in the digital preservation world, and I know many of us are sometimes really sick and tired of having requests in our mailing boxes around yet another survey. Um, the NDSA staffing survey is an excellent resource uh, that was presented at uh, IPRESS here as well, as is the uh, Open Preserva Preservation Foundation digital preservation community survey. But what these surveys do, they um, typically survey typic, uh, or target institutions and individuals. So those are the people who are being asked. And there we found that there's no existing survey about networks. Networks never get asked, but they exist. Um, so there's a lot of questions that we're interested in when we want to think of digital preservation networks. Like, what topics do other networks tackle? Uh, do they have similar working groups like we do in Nestor? Or are they far more specialized? Are there typically just dedicated digital preservation networks, or are there, is digital preservation just one of the tasks that are integrated into a much larger network that, uh, for example, exists for the entire library world within a country? And where do the, these digital preservation networks exist? So with that in mind, we knew we wanted to do a survey. First thing you need to do when you have a survey is talk about definitions to ensure that you all understand the same things when you say stuff. So the first thing we want to define is the question of what is a community? Community and networks, I use that interchangeably in the talk. Um, it's in the present, in the survey, it's strictly called a community. It is defined as an open group of individuals and or institutions. So open group kind of excludes secret societies, but those are hard to detect anyways when you're trying to do a survey. That community should engage with the subject of digital preservation, not necessarily as their main interest, but it could be just one of several subjects that they tackle as well. And they need to go beyond supplying a product or a commercial service. So um, it shouldn't be a community that is solemnly run by a vendor in order to sell a product. In addition, we said that communities can be local, regional, national, or international. So international like the DPC, national like Nestor, or local, there's many cities that have digital preservation meetups, for example. And we wanted to hear from those communities too, because they are grassroots efforts, and they have a lot to say and contribute about communities. So 
we said that communities can be large or small. We wanted to hear from all of them. And they can be product related or not product related as long as they go beyond just supplying that product. So the survey set up. We started out by drafting a lot of questions, then organizing those in five different categories. General info, we wanted to know where they're at, uh, what year they're funded, so to know what, how long they've been around for, where do they get their money from? How are they financed? Um, how are they organized? Do they have boards that uh, kind of determine what happens within the organization? Do they have regular membership meetings? Um, what kind of subjects do they cover? How many working groups do they have? And then in communication, do they have a mailing list? How do they communicate with their members? Are there social media channels? And for events, do they have events? If so, what is the target audience? Um, how big is the audience typically? How often do they have events? Because many networks have events that go far beyond their membership base. Um, it's more like an outreach thing. Overall, we ended up with 40 questions. It was an online questionnaire. It was distributed via mailing lists, social media channels, and direct contact. And that is probably the moment in time where I have to apologize to several of you for writing you a lot of nagging emails about please completing the survey. Um, yes, I was one of these people who kept on spamming, kept on spamming your mailbox. But it did, it did help. So the timeline, and this is uh, the, a, bit, a little bit of a sore point here. You see uh, in small print underneath that the timeline's pretty long. We started in February 2019 and ended up uh, in April 2022. You can break it down into four phases. Again, we started out with an ideal uh, thing of how things could be. We were pretty good at definition and preparation, and then the actual survey time, the analysis, and the preparation of publications took quite some time. And there's reasons for that. Um, a couple of reasons are that uh, during phase two and three, we had to chase respondents and partially incomplete answers. So some people had already filled out the survey, but um, they had they'd quit in the middle after the deadline, and we wanted to ensure that we would get as wide of a representation as possible, so we tried to get in contact with these people. Um, phase four included feedback from the institutions on community profiles. I will explain in a minute what that is in detail. And then this thing happened right in the middle of it. So we can say or towards the beginning, and that's actually one of the main reasons for the long timeline. And I think it's something that we might all have experienced, that this is a classic example of what I call a pandemic project. You start with the best intentions and your idea of what how working collaboratively, what it looks like, and then something happens where your small team that is working on this is sent to home office, has to take care of their children, has to organize a lot of things, so we had to re-postpone the the timeline frequently. So some lessons learned for us based on that is that um, if we repeat this, we want to regularly check the responses even while the survey is already running to ensure that we can directly liaison with incomplete answers and respondents. And also a more general thing that not every, everything in life can be planned ahead for. I think we all learned that during the pandemic. So the outcomes. I mentioned the community profiles. That's uh, one of two key outcomes of the survey. We have 32 community profiles that are currently published. Um, the map shows where the, um, uh, the institutions come from. The one in Antarctica is a little bit cheating. It's the Australian Antarctica archive, and I just think it looks really cool to locate them down there. Um, but, and it, that it, I looked that up. That is part of Australia, so um, I think it's completely valid. Um, the community profiles were generated from survey answers, and we then sent that community profile to the respondent, uh, asking them to please check and ensure that that is what they would like to see published. There's this example of a screenshot below and the link to the community um, survey files. They're all uh, published in PDF on the website. So the community profiles are an ideal resource to discover new communities in general. If you just want to see what's out there, uh, you can just browse the list. You can find out more about a specific community. So if you ever wanted to know how the DPC is funded or uh, what kind of working groups they have or how many events they have, go and look at their profile. Um, and it can also be used, of course, that if you participate yourself to enhance the visibility of your own community. So to showcase how that community profile can be used, to go back to the beginning question, who or what is Nestor? Based on the breakdown of the profile, we can now look at the general characteristics. We know where it's located, that it, um, it's distributed throughout the entire country, that it target, targets libraries, archives, museums. Um, we can see how it's financed, uh, what kind of boards exist, uh, what kind of um, services they offer. 
We can see what the organizational structure is, so the actual breakdown, what's the percentage of members that are archives, what's the percentage of members that are libraries and so forth. How many corporations do they have, so how well are they integrated into that wider landscape. Um, what their communication types are, how many um, mailings they typically have on their mailing list and so forth, and how many events they organize. So all of those questions, who or what is Nestor, can easily be answered using the community profile. And you can do that for all 32 communities that um, allowed us to have their profiles published. The second outcome is the results report. So this actually presents the results for all 40 questions and all 54 communities. So out of the 54 communities, only 32 allowed us to publish their profiles. Some of them felt like they didn't want that, they didn't want to share that information out, but they wanted to ensure that it's included in the survey. So this is the anonymized version of it. Um, it's the data presented uh, by question type only, so there's no chance for you to actually kind of jump to conclusions by different answer types across the same line. It's uh, also published online, the link is down here. And um, in comparison to the community profiles, this is more or less um, a resource for a comparative study of digital preservation communities to detect gaps, commonalities, um, and development and to uh, use as a data resource. So just an, a couple examples for questions that you can answer using that survey. You can, um, if you ask how communities are financed, there's the table and breakdown that shows you how different communities are financed around the world. So you see that membership fees is rather a large source of income for a lot, but as is in-kind contribution. And I'll jump through these quickly. Um, there's more detailed ones actually in the paper. You can see what kind of services these communities are offered. Uh, these offer, so you can see that classic community survey rank highest, like knowledge transfer and um, community building, which I think are the core reasons why networks and communities exist. But the second strongest group is technology and tool focused. Um, and sorry, the first box kind of on the right moved a little bit, but they actually offer services or they develop tools together. Um, so this is actually a strong reason why digital preservation communities exist. But there's also room for interpretation. For example, there's, it says that six say they offer services around uh, certification, which is interesting because we only know three uh, certification frameworks that exist. So that would be something where we'd have to look into this in detail. So possibly in the future we could have a more granular options for future survey. So reflection and outlook, community survey is now an established Nestor product. We're planning to redo the survey um, next run 2023. We think 54 is a great response for a first uh, run, but um, and there has been a high interest in community survey results. We see that there's room for improvement. The timeline, we need faster release, release, release of results. We think possibly the releasing of uh, raw data in the cookbook and have a wider reach of the survey. And that's actually my last slide as a call to action. Uh, is your community on there? If not, why not? Please let us know and respond. Um, where are the communities outside of Central Europe, USA, Australia, and New Zealand? AV and web archiving are strong topics, but are there other content type topics that are currently not covered? Uh, where community archives, great keynote this morning, um, call to have those community archives, one person libraries and so forth included in there. And um, is there also digital preservation network for museums? So please help us fill the gaps and participate to make this survey even better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mickey. Um, does anyone, just uh, hold on. Does anyone have any questions for Mickey? We have a mic here. Yes, up this centre of the room there. Thanks. It's working. Hi, Remco van Wienendaal, National Archives of the Netherlands. Um, I had a really interesting, and thanks for your talk, by the way, really interesting discussion last week on DLM Forum where we uh, sat down and had a discussion on if you are a new player in the international field, which organization do you go to or which network do you join first if you have a limited resource uh, uh, available of money? Um, could you use your profiles for those people? What's your advice on that? 
Um, sure, so if you're just starting out with digital preservation, you want to see where, where your like-minded folks are. In, in the beginning, we had the idea to have, um, to have a table that you could query and say, I'm interested in AV preservation, show me all networks for that, or I'm located in the Netherlands, show me all networks near me. Um, the platform that we published the PDFs on is not as technically sophisticated enough to do that, so it's um, a bit of a crutch the way they're published now, but it can be used for that. So you can at least browse through the names now. Since it's 32 published, the number is fairly small, but as it grows, we know that we need different kind of entry points for people to actually reach the community that is of interest to them. And Yes, you can totally use that. There's um, communities as small as, there's a couple UK ones that meet regionally. I know in Cologne we have like a um, irregularly meeting where we have a presentation followed by a joint visit to the pub. So there's, I mean, there's always the, the it's like a conference visit, a good combination of presentations and, and networking. Yeah. Thank, oh, yes, there, thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mickey. That was a really good um, presentation. Um, so I belong to the, the Film Archive UK um, network, so I, I'm sort of part of a service, an individual service, but very much working in collaboration with a wider film archive network. I'm just wondering in terms of future surveys, will you be approaching just individual services or all those, those established networks? I just wonder whether that, that could be something to, to afford reach. If I understood your question correctly, you currently offer a service, but you also have a network? Yeah. Um, so. It, it, those were some of the discussion cases where we did. In most cases, we did decide to accept them. I think we looked at the way their, um, their financing works. If you're, if you, if you have a, if, the, if your only form of income is a strict licensing model and um, your network is not user run but product vendor run, that would be something that we wouldn't include. If you have other activities and it's more of a, of a network with established working groups and your members have a say in it, we would totally include you. So examples for communities included in there are the products like Prozevica user group, um, Rosetta user group, which are uh, customer run. Uh, and there's a couple of other examples in there where um, networks do offer a service to, but they have really active user bases, really active networks. So yes, I have doubt you can always contact us and we can discuss that offline. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yes, um, front row get front row of the middle there. Yeah, hi, I'm Carmen from the HTW Berlin. Um, I was just wondering, like I'm, I come from the digital preservation world, but now work at the research data management world, but uh, I'm kind of the one uh, who gets asked about digital preservation in the research data management world. So I was wondering if these kind of groups are also included because we, we also have like we have that topic as a topic. Yeah, they totally are. Like, examples for that is IFLA is included in there, for example, or YASA. So really, really large networks. Um, and they do have digital preservation working groups, International Council on Archives as well. So they're totally included. Yeah. Thank you. And Sharon, anything on Slido? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey.